Welcome to First Baptist Church. You're listening to the preaching ministry of Pastor Sherman Burkhead. Please check us out on the internet at fbcboron.org. Please turn with me in your Bibles to uh, Romans chapter 4. We're going to be reading verses 18 through 22. And let us pray for the reading and the preaching of God's Word. Heavenly Father, again, what a beautiful day you have given us. Springtime reminds us of your renewal and your mercy. That we are here sitting, gathered in a free country to be able to to listen to your word being preached without fear. That we're able to speak the name and sing of the name of Jesus without worrying about somebody coming through the door and, and stopping us. And that, Father, all of us, Lord, have been blessed by you in more ways than we can possibly count. And so, Lord, as we are here, privileged as we are, Lord, that you would prepare our hearts to receive from you your all-sufficient word, your word that changes and transforms hearts and minds, your word that is the power to save. I pray, Lord God, that you would use it today to continue to shape us and change us. You would use it to make us holy, that you would use us to use it to to help us to grow in righteousness, that you would use your word to give us hope when we struggle for hope, and that you would certainly use your word to give us assurance of the things that you have promised to do. I pray, Father God, that we would then, as a church, glorify you and how we hear this and apply it to our lives, Lord. And I pray, Lord God, that this worship service would be pleasing to you in your sight, and it would honor Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. So Romans chapter 4, beginning in verse 18, and the word of the sovereign Lord reads, In hope he believed against hope that he should become the father of many nations, as he had been told, so shall your offspring be. He did not weaken in the faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead since he was about a hundred years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. That is why. His faith was counted to him as righteousness. This is the word of the Lord. The reformer Martin Luther once wrote, Faith honors him whom it trusts with the most reverent and highest regard since it considers him truthful and trustworthy. There is no other honor equal to the estimate of uh, truthfulness and righteousness with which we honor him whom we trust. So while you have your Bibles out, please turn with me to James chapter 1. James is close to the end of your New Testament. James chapter 1, beginning in verse 2, James, the brother of Jesus, writes, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. James 
Again, the brother of Jesus speaks about the testing of our faith and how it produces in us in endurance. While we are still in the New Testament, why don't we turn back to the very beginning of the New Testament, or close to the beginning, Mark chapter 4. In Mark chapter 4, beginning in verse 3, Jesus himself says, Listen, behold, the sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seed fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured it. Other seed fell on the rocky ground where it did not have much soil, and immediately it sprang up, since it had no depth of soil. And when the sun rose, it was scorched, and since it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among the thorns. And the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no grain. And other seed fell into good soil and produced grain growing up and increasing and yielding thirtyfold and sixtyfold and a hundredfold. And then Jesus interpreting the text for us. He says this. The sower sows the word, and these are the ones along the path where the word is sown. When they hear, Satan immediately comes and takes away the word that is sown in them. This is the hardened heart. And these are the ones that were sown on rocky ground to the ones when they hear the word immediately receive it with joy, and they have no root in themselves, but endure for a while when... Then when tribulation and persecution arises on the count of the word, immediately they fall away. Again, proving that their faith was not to life. And then others are the ones sown among the thorns. They are the ones that hear the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and desires for things enter in and choke, choke the word and it proves unfruitful. But those who were sown on good soil are the ones who hear the word, accept it, and it bear fruits 30-fold and 60-fold and 100-fold. The truth is simply this. It is very easy to trust in God when the sun is shining. It is easy to say, praise the Lord when your life is good. It is easy to be a Christian when it doesn't cost anything to be a Christian. It is easy to give glory to God when everything in the world seems right. But true faith in God reveals itself ultimately when it's tested, when the rains come, when life is hard. This is why when I counsel people during difficult times, I always bring them to the same point, and I say the same things, right? Now is the time. Now is the time that you need to look inside and ask yourself, do you really trust God? Do you really believe what He said to you? Now that your life is falling apart, now that, that the worst case scenario has happened to you, now that you didn't get the diagnosis that you wanted, it's actually worse. Now that you feel completely alone, now that you, you feel completely used up and worthless, now is the time to examine yourself. Do you really believe the promises that God has made you? Do you believe that He really does love you as He said He does? Do you really believe that He will not leave you or forsake you as He has promised that He would, wouldn't? Do you believe that He will keep you from being snatched out of His hands, as Jesus Himself said? Do you believe that He will work all things out for your good? Do you believe that He has gone to prepare a place for you, and that He's coming back for you, and that one day He will bring you safely home? In the darkest moments of life, in those times when the world is shouting at you, you have no reason to believe. Do you still trust Him? 
When your faith is tested, will you prove, will your faith prove to be true? Do you really believe that God is trustworthy and that he's capable of keeping his promises to you? This is actually the very thing that we see in the text here with Abraham. When everything seemed to be beyond all hope, he still believed. Now, before we jump in here, let's just talk about context, about the passage that we're in. If you remember, Paul wrote this letter to the, the, the church in Rome, and he did so for three basic reasons. First of all, he desired to build a relationship with the church in Rome because he wanted to establish a new base of operation there because he wanted to go further west. He was a missionary. He was on fire to take the gospel as far as he possibly could go. And so he knew that he couldn't keep doing what he was doing from Antioch. He had to go further west, and Rome was the perfect launching point for that. And so he writes this letter to introduce himself to the church at Rome. Secondly, he wrote this letter to ease the tension between the Jews and the Gentiles. Hopefully, as we've been going along, you can tell in the language and what Paul has been dealing with that there is some tension there. There is tension between those two groups of people. Not only is there ongoing tension because there's a tendency of the Jewish people to think very highly of themselves as, as, as varsity Christians because they have the law and they were, they were circumcised, right? Not only did, was that an issue, but then the Jews who started the church in Rome at one point were kicked out of Rome altogether by the, by the emperor for a period of time. And when they came back, they found the church thriving and growing, but now fully established with Gentile leadership in the church. And so there was this tension between these two groups of people. But then third, perhaps most importantly, he wanted to write the letter because the church in Rome didn't have an apostle over them. And he wanted to make it really clear Right, the understanding of the gospel is. This is why Paul is so deliberate in unpacking the gospel in such great detail. And so Paul explains from the beginning he's not ashamed of the gospel because the gospel is the power of God to save those who believe, Jew and Gentile alike. And I just want to take a moment then on that basis to remind you of that truth. If there's a truth that we as Christians can almost let slide to the back of our mind, it is this truth. The gospel, the gospel is the power of God for salvation. The gospel is the power of God, not church programs, right? Not articulate evangelists, not well-trained apologists, not ministries of mercy. I, as a pastor, am not the power of God for salvation. You are not the power of God for salvation. Right? Though all of these things are important and all of these things are useful and all of these things are important for ministry, none of these things are the power of God to save anyone. The gospel is God's power to save. The truth about who He is, the truth about who we are in light of who He is, and the truth of what He has done for us in spite of us is the power of God to save. That's why we must at all times continually proclaim the gospel. That's why the gospel must always be the center point of our ministry and all the things that we do as a church. That's why we, when we go out into the world, yes, we need to love people. We need to meet people's needs. But what they need more than anything else is the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is the power of God to bring anyone back into right relationship with him. The gospel is the power that God has given to bring people out of death and into life. And so we must never, ever compromise or ever lose sight of the centrality of the gospel. And that's how Paul opens up his explanation of the gospel. He says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. And then he begins to unpack the, the gospel and the most complete explanation found in the New Testament. But the thing is that he doesn't start with the good news. He doesn't start with the good news itself. He actually starts somewhere else. And guess what? He doesn't start with the phrase, God has a wonderful plan for your life. He doesn't start with the phrase, you know, God loves you and he's just so amazed by you. 
He doesn't start with, you know, God sees you struggling. He just, he just wants to come alongside you if you just let him. No. He starts where you must start with the gospel, with the bad news. As we have said over and over again, a person will not take the medicine unless they understand the diagnosis. He starts with the bad news, the bad news that makes the good news necessary, the bad news that makes the good news relevant, the bad news that all of mankind, all of them, are at odds with the God who made them. And from chapter 1, verse 18, to chapter 3, verse 22, Paul compellingly argues that all of mankind is under the condemnation and justice and wrath of God because all of mankind has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All of mankind is in rebellion. Jew and Gentile alike, the atheist and the self-righteous religious person. All of mankind stands in exactly the same ground and faces the same devastating problem. They are at odds with the God who created them, and there's nothing that they can do to fix it by themselves. That's where Paul begins with the bad news. But then in verse, chapter 3, verse 23, Paul turns the corner and declares the beauty of the good news. He writes this. He says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by His blood to be received by faith. Brothers and sisters, that indeed is good news. Paul declares that even though that we were sinners deserving of God's justice, he took the initiative on his own to put forward his own son so that we could have our sins forgiven, not because of what we've done, but because of what Christ has done. And that we could be counted as righteous, not because we were righteous, but because Christ is righteous. And all of this is a gift of grace, God's grace, that is simply received by us by faith alone. And that is the point all the way up to the end of chapter 4. Paul leaves no doubt at all by what he means by this. In fact, he continually hammers this point home. We are justified by grace through faith in Christ. We are counted righteous because we believe. And this has nothing to do with the works that we can do, be it keeping the law or finding some way to make God be pleased with us. It is a gift of grace received by faith. And Paul in chapter 4 begins then to point to Abraham to give us illustration, historically speaking. He points to Abraham, the father of the Jewish nation, and also, as we learned, the father of all who believe. And he points to him as the prototypical example of saving faith which is what we've been talking about for the last several weeks. According to Paul, Abraham is the example of faith for us because he was justified by faith. And we talk about this over and over again, but you can't say it often enough. Paul makes it clear that God made a promise to Abraham. Abraham believed God, and because he believed, God counted him and his faith as righteousness. God granted to Abraham the kind of righteousness that's required to be in right relationship with God based on nothing but the faith and the promise that God had made. By that faith, he was declared righteous. And and Paul is saying that Abraham was justified by faith. And so were we. Abraham is also the faith because, uh, uh, example of the faith because he was justified apart by faith apart from the works of the law. That almost seems redundant, but nowadays you have to say it out loud and remind people of that. He was justified by faith apart from any works. Abraham was not justified because he kept the law. The law didn't come until after 400 years after that. He was not declared righteous because he was circumcised. He didn't get circumcised until at least 13 years after that. He was justified in the sight of God by faith alone, just as we are. And so, Christian, when, when you talk to your brothers and sisters, your friends around you, when you have conversation with other fellow Christians, when you get a chance to witness, you need to remind them and remind yourself, we are not saved by our ability to keep the law. We are not saved because we keep the Ten Commandments. We are not saved because we keep a set of rules that some Christians think are really important to keep. We are not saved 
because of the law, and we're not saved because of a religious ritual like baptism. Baptism is a command of God, and it's important, and it's part of becoming a Christian, but it is not the mechanism that brings us into justification. Our baptism is the fruit of our justification, not the root of it. Right? So we're not saved by our religiousness. We're not saved by coming to church every single week. You should be here every single week, but it's not what saves you. We, like Abraham and every other believer before us, are justified by faith apart from our works. And Paul, again, uses Abraham as an example of that. But what we see in our text today is Abraham is an example of faith for us because he had unwavering faith. Abraham believed the promise of God even when it was hard to believe. He believed because he knew God was faithful, that God could and would keep his promise, which is ultimately where we're going to land today. Just kind of giving you a heads up. But let's look, let's look and see how we get there. Beginning in, in verse 18 in chapter 4 of Romans, Paul writes, In hope he believed against hope that he should become the father of many nations as he had been told so shall your offspring be. I've always been a fan, right? not always, but ever since I began reading, reading it, I've been a fan of the ESV, and I've been a fan of the New American Standard Bible. I like the precision of the, of the language. I love the fact that they try very hard to go as close as they can word for word. But at times, like this, the word for word doesn't really give us a lot of clarity. What does he mean? In hope, he believed against hope. It's a bit clumsy. The New, Amer New National Version, not a, a, a translation I spend a lot of time with, but I think does a pretty good job. Um, it's more of a thought for thought. I think it gets a little bit more closer to what Paul is saying. Against all hope, Abraham in hope believed. I think that makes a little bit more sense. It gives you a little bit more of an understanding of what, what Paul is communicating. And then there's the New Living Translation, which is a dynamic equivalent. I don't spend a lot of time with the New Living Translation, except when maybe I'm looking for a little easier rendering. Uh, but it renders this phrase in a way that I think is really, really helpful for us and, and gets at what Paul, I think, is what, what Paul's driving at. And it reads this way. Even when there was no reason for hope, Abraham kept hoping believing that he would become the father of many nations, for God had said to him. I think it's a really good rendering. This is a powerful declaration that Paul is making here. A powerful declaration that he's making about Abraham. Even when there was no reason for hope, Abraham kept hoping and kept believing. I want you to let that statement sink into your mind. I think there are times we just need to come back to this, especially where we are in the world today. Even when there was no reason, no visible reason, even when there's no reason to compel him to have hope, Abraham kept hoping and believing. I cannot overstress the, the, how big this declaration is. Why would Paul make such a dramatic statement about Abraham? I mean, because when we look back at Abraham, when we stand where we are right now, we think, man, Abraham was a man of faith. Man, you know, he walked with God. We don't, we don't think about the struggles that he must have went through. But look at verse 19. It says, He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead, since he was about 100 years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. Paul makes such a dramatic statement because, humanly speaking, Abraham had no reason at all to hope that he and Sarah would have a child together. He had no human, biological, scientific, physical reason to hope. The thing that we need to keep in mind is that when God first made the promise to era, I mean Abraham and, and Sarah, they were both much younger at the time. 
And then they would have been physically able to have children. In fact, when God called Abraham out of Ur, the Bible tells us that he was 75 years old, which would have made Sarah about 65. But in their youth, before, before that, I mean, because 65 and 75 doesn't sound like spring chickens when it comes to having kids, right? But, but I mean, obviously, they must have believed that they could have. We also know that probably didn't have, you know, all the, all the great food that we have that makes us old fast, I guess. I don't know. But in their youth before that, they never were able to have children. For some reason, Sarah was not able to conceive. But God repeated this promise again and again. And Abraham continued to believe. And, and then Sarah gave Abraham her handmaiden, thinking, well, maybe God has a different plan. And then she tries to kind of get ahead of God a little bit and then gives, her, gives him her handmaiden, and then she gets pregnant and has a child through her. But God said, this is not the promised offspring. He said that you will have a child with Sarah, a child from your wife, and he will become a great nation. And Abraham, in spite of the fact he had no evidence for that, except the promise of God, he continued to believe. But year after year, Abraham grew more and more wealthy. And the numbers of his household continued to grow because of the servants kept multiplying. And he'd certainly become more and more powerful. But yet, as they continued on, as the days went on, there was no child bet between him and Sarah. And the years turned into decades. And then it got to the point where there was no physical reason to believe. In fact, Abraham had every reason not to believe. I mean, think about this. He was a hundred years old. A hundred. Think about that for a second. We live in a time right now where people are living longer, and it's not unusual for us to see people celebrating their 100th birthday, but I don't care how good a shape that they're in, not one of them ever looks like they're ready to have kids. Right? Not one of them, right? I mean, let's just be honest. 100 is old. I mean, don't want to be politically incorrect, but 100 is old. 100 isn't what it once was. In fact, I just turned 51 a few weeks ago. And one of the truths that I continually face and I've had to come to terms with is I just can't do everything I used to do. I can't. I can't do it. Even though that I'm still active, even though I work out five days a week with my kids, even though that I can actually outwork them and I'm physically strong, there are still so many things I cannot do anymore. And there are things that when I do try to do them, I regret them instantly. And if you've got any miles on you at all, you know what I'm talking about. My body isn't what it once was. I cannot throw a baseball more than a couple of times without my elbow being on fire. It just, I can't do it. I cannot physically work the way that I used to in construction. Every time I start a project around the house, I think, I'm going to get that done in like three hours. Eight hours later, in about 50 ibuprofen, you know, I'm, I'm done. Not to mention, I can't imagine right now having a new child. I mean, we love kids, but I can't imagine. I mean, we have grandkids, so they, they come to our house, we spoil them rotten and send them home. I can't imagine what it would be like to have a brand new baby at 51, much less 100 years old. But Abraham, 100 years old, right, was still believing, even though he was well past his years of potency. Not to mention Sarah was old too, 90 years old. She was 90 years old. And the Bible says that she that the, that the way of the woman had ceased. Right? Or in other words, that she was already past menopause. Like that whole possibility was already done. But even more than that, she had, been, she had proven her entire adult life that she was barren. I mean, think about this. Sarah was described as a beautiful woman, desirable woman, when she was in her 60s. And Abraham loved her very much. And they've been married since they were very young, probably since Sarah was a teenager, as the custom was during that time. Which means, as a couple, they would have had a lot of practice trying to 
figure out how to get kids. Even before they even left Ur. Remember, he was called out of Ur at 75 and she was 65. They had decades in their old city where they had lots of experience as a couple. And so humanly speaking, it should have been a settled conclusion for them. If she didn't have kids by now, she's never going to have them. I mean, if Sarah was going to get pregnant, it would have, they would have expected it to have been done much sooner. But Sarah was, by all human reasons, barren, infertile, unable to have kids, and now 90 years old and post-menopausal. And so in light of her, in light, the idea of her having children was an impossibility. The truth is there was no reason to believe they would have children. Humanly speaking, it was hopeless. Humanly speaking, there was no reasonable reason to have hope. There was no reason to believe except for God's promise. There was no reason to hope at all except for the fact that God made Abraham a promise which is not unlike where we find ourselves today. When we look around the world, it's easy to become very cynical because the world appears to be upside down. Right is called wrong, wrong is called right. I mean, right now, they're in, this week, there are states in our nation they are trying to not pass laws to protect abortion, but they're trying to pass laws that sanction infanticide after the baby is born, up to several weeks. I mean, think about that. What a radical transition that's happened in our, church, in our world's culture that we can even conceive of that. Remember when they talked about abortion like 20 years ago? Well, it's safe and and. And and legal and rare. It's just a clump of cells. They don't care. They're not even arguing anymore. Right? They know it's a baby. They don't care. In fact, there was whistleblowers who have physical proof that an abortion clinic had murdered five full-term babies. Right? They have the bodies. And the police are not investigating the clinic. They're investigating the whistleblowers. Trying to press charges against them. The White House just this week said that giving puberty blockers and reassignment surgery to children in grade school is part of the best practices to help people overcome gender dysphoria. You would think this is coming out of a dystopian novel somewhere, right? This is reality. Teachers and administrators in, in schools across the country believe they have the right to talk about sex and sexuality to your children as young as four years old without your knowledge and your permission. That you don't even have, the, have any business knowing what the teacher's talking to your child about. Would that have even been possible 20 years ago? They, they would have been burning schools down 20 years ago. Companies like Disney are using political and financial muscle to try to undo legislation that protects children from being groomed and preyed upon by sexual predators. Our country, and and, and how about this, our country is spending itself into oblivion, saddling our children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren with with a debt they're never, ever, ever going to be able to repay. And then this is all fueled by the ideology of wokeness, which is everywhere creating divisions at every possible level, especially divisions between ethnicities, particularly between people who are white and all people of color, rather than actually fixing the tension between groups, it's actually making it worse. Our country is rotting from the inside out. We can see it. It's obvious. (laughs) And we think about what can we do, and we almost stand helpless, like, what can we do? Our country is rotting from the inside out, and it's the tip of the iceberg. And even worse, our nation's becoming increasingly secular. Christianity has fallen out of favor at all levels of education. I mean, if you believe in Christ, you believe in the Bible, you're looked down upon as somebody who's unintelligent. And then in the post-COVID world, the church is shrinking. And it's not just here, by the way. It's all over. I had lunch with a couple of uh, pastors, friends of mine. Um, They lead churches in Lancaster and Palmdale, and they're seeing exactly the same things that we're seeing here in Boron. 
across the board. Fewer numbers, a decrease in giving, and a shrinking children's ministry that just seems to be so odd. The world has radically changed in just a couple of years, but it seems to be things are accelerating. War in Europe is raging again. And there are so many people who hate the message of the gospel. Preachers and ministers and Christians are experiencing a growth in violence, not in Africa or the Middle East, but in the Western world, in the United States, in Canada, and in Europe. It seems hopeless. When you survey the world around us, you see the things that people put on, on on social media and television, you go, how could you even possibly think in those terms? It seems like nothing is going to change. It's going to continue to accelerate and get worse. Humanly speaking, it's hopeless except for the promises of God. The promise that, that He will one day return and make all things right. Or that He will come back and make all things new. The promise that He will wipe away every tear from our eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away. If we lived by what we see in this world like Abraham, humanly speaking, we would have no reason to hope. We'd have every reason to lose hope and give up. Except that God made a promise. Notice it says he didn't weaken in faith even when he considered the fact about his age and his wife's barrenness. Even when he considered the facts of reality that were before him, he didn't weaken in his faith. In fact, it said that no unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God, but rather he grew strong in his faith and he gave glory to God. Think about that for a minute. Abraham grew strong in his faith, even when he had no human reason to believe. There are times that the Lord has to bring you out to that place where you have no other alternative but to hold on to Him so that your faith will be strengthened. And not only did he grow strong in his faith, it says that he gave glory to God. He glorified God as the years continued by and the promise was unfulfilled. Well, how? Well, John Stott, I think, does a really good job actually interpreting this. And he says this. He goes, Instead, he strengthened himself by means of his faith. In this way, he gave glory to God. That is to say, he glorified God. And hear this. He glorified God by letting God be God. And by trusting him to be true to himself as God the God of creation and resurrection. Abraham grew in his faith and glorified God because he let God be God. I'm going to tell you one thing right now. If there's a truth that sometimes we as Christians simply just need to come back to is we just need to let God be God. I know that there are times when Things don't go my way, and I, and I want to do what I can do to manipulate circumstances and get out ahead of things and do what I can do to plan. And, 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 and then sometimes I realize, it's like, wait a minute, I'm not even in control of the fact that I woke up this morning. I just need to let God be God, right? There are people in my life that I love very deeply and dearly who are not walking with God, who are right now outside of the kingdom. And if they died today, I know that they would not be with me in heaven. My heart breaks deeply for that. I want to take it personally. I want to take it my, make my personal mission to hold them down and do whatever they have to do to actually put their faith in, in God. But I'm reminded over and over again that I can't do anything to change a person's heart. I cannot bring anyone into salvation. I cannot escort anybody into the kingdom by my efforts. All I can do is what I'm called to do. Sow the seed, love the people, Pray for God to change their hearts and let God be God. Sometimes I think we as Christians, at times, we'll take it so personal that we think that it's our personal responsibility to make sure people get into the kingdom. It is not your job 
It is your job to tell them over and over again about the gospel. It is your job over and over again to show them the love of Christ. But you have not the power within you. So we must let God be God. Abraham grew in his faith and he glorified God because he let God be God. Because he, as Paul says, was fully convinced God could keep his promise. That's what it says. No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. This right here is the heart of the issue. This is the heart of what we have been talking about for the last several weeks. Last week we talked about what makes a promise a guarantee. What makes a promise something you can trust? We identified two things. Number one, the person who makes the promise must be what? Trustworthy. They must be willing to keep the promise. They must be willing to do whatever it takes to keep their promise. They must be trustworthy. And number two, they must also have the ability to keep the promise. They must be able, they must be capable of delivering on the promise that they've made. It's not enough for someone to have the desire to keep a promise if they don't have the ability to keep the promise. And it's not enough for someone to have all the resources in the world to be able to keep the promise if they don't have the inclination to do so. You must have both. And what we saw is God is both trustworthy and capable. That's the conclusions that we came to over the last two weeks. God is both trustworthy and capable. God is trustworthy because it is His very nature to be truthful. It's His very nature to be just and keep His word. In fact, God would sooner cease to be God than He not keep His promise. And then as we saw last week, God is the one who can do the impossible. He is the one, as Paul said, that brings life to the dead. In fact, that's what Abraham's story is about, by the way. This is why God let this go as long as he did, so that it would be completely God. Abraham and his wife's body were as good as dead, both of them beyond the ability to continue life into the next generation, both of them dead in that sense. But God being God, can do the impossible. And Abraham had faith that even if it required a miracle, a resurrection proportion, that God could keep his word. This is what Abraham understands. It doesn't matter how many years goes by. It doesn't matter what the circumstances of the, the world around us look like. It doesn't matter what the world says or what the world does. There are two immutable facts that Abraham is holding on to. God is both trustworthy and God is capable. And because of that, he was fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. And here's the thing that we need to see. Abraham isn't trusting. I want you to hear me on this. this is, I don't want to lose you in the weeds, but please hear me. Abraham isn't trusting in his ability to believe. He's trusting in God's ability to keep his promise. And the reason why this is important is some people will look at Abraham's faith and say, well, man, his faith is the key. I mean, he's the stalwart man of God. He never struggled and never doubted and never worried. And this is simply not true. When you survey Genesis, you'll see that there are there are moments that Abraham had. Abraham believed God, but there were times he had questions. In fact, he even asked them. He believed God, but he and his wife both laughed when God promised because the prospect of the impossible happening to them seemed almost too good to be true. I mean, if you remember the story, you know, Sarah laughed, and then God said, why is Sarah laughing? She goes, I didn't laugh. He goes, yes, you did. Abraham believed by grace because he was holding on to the character of God, not because of his ability never to struggle. This is the thing that we need to hold on to as Christians, I think, especially when in the growing darkness. The promise doesn't rest on Abraham in any way. It rests completely on God and his ability. His faith is strong and his faith is not futile, not because of Abraham himself. It's because of the object of his faith. And that's 
the truth that we need to remember. In fact, as we approach Easter, this is the point that I want to drive home. Abraham is the example of us for us because he was justified by faith apart from works and because his faith didn't waver even when he had every reason, humanly speaking, not to believe. That even in the darkness and even when the doubts crept in and even when his emotions were challenging him and even when the biological facts shouted that it wasn't going to happen, Abraham held on not because he was strong. He held on because God is God. And God is faithful even if our faith is bold and strong or even if our our faith is frail and weak and we're hanging on by a thread. It's not the strength of our faith that saves. It's the power of God to do what God has promised. Theologian and professor Don Carson illustrates this point very well as he talked about the Passover. By the way, the Passover obviously, is a foreshadow of the work of Christ in the resurrection. But I'd like to just read for you this little short thing that he says here. It's a little illustration, and I can't do it justice, so I'm just going to read what he says. He says, Picture two Jews named Smith and Brown. Remarkably Jewish names. The day before the first Passover, they're having a little discussion in the land of Goshen, and Smith says to Brown, Boy, are you a little nervous about what's going to happen tonight? Brown says, well, God told us what to do through through his servant Moses. You don't have to be nervous. Haven't you slaughtered the lamb and daubed the doorpost with the blood? Haven't you put the the blood on the lintel? Haven't you done that? You're, You're all ready to go and packed, aren't you? You're ready to eat the whole Passover meal with your family. Well, of course I've done that. I'm not stupid. But it's still pretty scary when you think of all the things that have happened here recently, right? You know, the flies and the river turning to blood. It's pretty awful. And you know, there's a threat of the firstborn being killed, you know? And it's it's all right for you. You have like three kids. You have three sons. I got the one. I love my Charlie. And the angel of death is passing through tonight. I know that God says to put the blood there, but it's still pretty scary. I'll just be glad when it's over. And the other one responded, bring it on. I trust in the promises of God. That night, the angel of death swept through the land. Which one lost his son? And the answer, of course, is neither. Because death doesn't pass over them on the grounds of the intensity or the clarity of the faith exercised, but on the grounds of the blood of the Lamb. That's what silences the accuser. The blood silences the accuser of the brothers as he's accused us before God. He silences our consciences when we accuse ourselves directly. How many times do we writhe in agony, as Don Carson says, asking if God could ever love us enough, if God could ever care for us enough after we've done such stupid, sinful, rebellious things after being Christians for 40 years? He asks, what are we going to say? Oh God, I tried really hard, you know. I did my best. It was just a bad moment. No, I have no other argument. I have no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. We overcome him by the blood of the Lamb. There is no, there is the ground for all of human assurance before God. There is the ground of our faith. Not guaranteeing intensity of faith, so fickle are we. He finishes and says, It's not the intensity of our faith, but the object of our faith that saves. They overcome him on the grounds of the blood of the Lamb. For 25 years, Abraham trusted and followed God. For 25 years, He believed the promise through the wanderings, through the trials, through the warfare, through the strife that was even in his own home between him and his wife, through being twice discovered to be a coward and a liar, even through his wife's body shriveling up into very old age. He continued to trust God because His faith, not because his faith was intense, 
but because he was convinced of God being God. God would and could do what he promised to do. He knew that God was powerful enough and faithful enough to do what he said that he would do. And he, by faith, held on to that. And as Paul says, that is why his faith was counted to him as righteousness. And so theologically speaking, Paul is drawing the inescapable conclusion that God has made a way for man to be justified and reconciled to him. And that has nothing to do with what we can do for God, but what God has done for us by his grace. And the truth that the gift of righteousness and the gift of forgiveness of sins, those are received by us simply on the basis of faith. Right? God makes a promise. We believe the promise. And because of that belief, we, like Abraham, are declared to be righteous. That's the theological conclusion that Paul is driving at before he transitions in chapter 5 to the blessings of the gospel. But practically speaking today, let me just remind you that the strength of your faith doesn't rest on your ability to never struggle. I want you to just to take that home and let that comfort you. Because I know some of you probably at times are struggling. The strength of your faith does not rest on your ability never to struggle. It doesn't rest on your, your ability to never ask God, where are you? God, why is this happening to me? The strength of your faith doesn't rest on your ability to be optimistic in every situation. I want you to know it was very damaging to me in my early Christian life that I encountered people who, who basically led me to believe that you must always be positive, always be positive, always be positive. You can never, ever, ever even appear like you might be struggling or having a bad day or have doubts. The strength of your faith doesn't rest on your ability to be optimistic. The strength of your faith doesn't rest on you ever, never ever feeling discouraged or lost or alone. Guess what? You're a human being. There are going to be times you're going to be discouraged. There are going to be times in your life you're going to feel like everyone's against you. It just is going to happen. There are times that you are going to feel alone. The strength of your faith rests on the fact that God is God and that He is faithful and able to do what He promised. And He promised that if you will believe even the tiniest seed of faith, you will be saved. You see, the promise of God is this. You can't do it. And so God came into the world to do it for you. He lived the perfect life that you couldn't live earning a righteousness you could never earn, making atonement for your sins that you could never atone for. And He bore in your body the full weight of the wrath of God that you could not withstand. And then He tore down the barrier between you and God, a barrier that you would never be able in a thousand lifetimes to ever be able to overcome. And then as proof of that, He rose three days later, proving that not only is He God in the flesh, but the way to God is open for all who would come to Him. Not by what they do, not by their religiousness, but by faith in the promise. And so my encouragement to you is this. If you don't know Christ, repent and believe the gospel and have life in life today. But if you are a Christian, my encouragement now as we, again, approach the, the season of hope, that no matter where life finds you, Hold on to the truth. God promised to save you, and God is faithful to keep His promise. Hold on to Christ. When the darkness closes in, remember that promise is sure. When you fall down and make a mess of things, again, when you have fallen back into sin, the same sin you've fallen into a thousand times and you keep repenting of over and over again, remember, your hope is not in your ability to make God love you. Your hope is in the promise that God has made you. Hold on to Christ. We pray for you. You've been listening to the preaching ministry of Pastor Sherman Burkhead, a production of First Baptist Church in Boron, California. 
Our website address is fbcboron.org. And would you please consider partnering with us financially as we work to share the hope and the gospel of Jesus Christ with our community and our world.